So I'd like to invite up Dr. Rusty Shavey, who is uh, no stranger to this crowd. He is part of the, the three people who um, ideated this, this conference, this lecture series, and we're so blessed to have him. So Dr. Shavey graduated from the University of Texas Medical Branch back in 92. He then went on to the University of Michigan where he completed his residency in family medicine in 1995. And after two years at the University of North Carolina, he returned to the University of Michigan where he has been on the faculty in the Department of Family Medicine since 97 and has served as chief of the of department for the many years. Dr. Shavey and several of his colleagues founded Emmaus Health just across the street here at Domino's Farms in 2014 as a way to create a model for Catholic outpatient primary care, initially in Ann Arbor, but with an eye towards extending the model to other communities throughout the country. Dr. Shavey is a native Texan, but now enjoys living in Ann Arbor with his wife and his seven children. And they are members of St. Thomas the Apostle Catholic Church here in Ann Arbor. Dr. Rusty Shavey. Thanks, Joe. It's good to be here. It's a little too obvious to talk about the need for technological resilience, uh, given the challenges we're having today. So, I've, as Joe said, I've been a part of this program since the beginning, and I'm the setup guy. I don't have any expertise, but I introduce the topics and set up those who do. So, the, you've seen the official topic, and I was a little hesitant to put up my topic because I was afraid it was going to be too much of a reveal, and now that you know what I'm going to say, I, you know, I hope you'll still be able to capture your attention, but, um, you know, so... Larry Bird and Scripture, I think you see those two things combined all the time. Um, <laughs> so, all right, if I can see if this is going to work here. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about resilience, and I'm going I'm to present a progressive uh, concept of resilience. I'm calling it an ascendancy or a progression instead of a hierarchy because a hierarchy would imply superiority of one level over another and that may not indeed be the case here. Indeed there are some systems for which resilience might be negative instead of positive though I think our tendency is to think about resilience as a normative state and a, and a positive state. The concepts that I'm going to describe about resilience are not unique, they're not my own. There's copious literature written about resilience. The idea of this ascendancy is indeed mine, but it was really more an ascendancy in the richness of the understanding of resilience and the richness in which we might want to apply it to our lives. There is no recognized taxonomy here. So when I mention recovery as level one resilience, that's not a recognized taxonomy, simply what I put together for this conference. Um, and you know, as an academic, you, you sort of put things into these, uh, these quanta and, and you put these fancy labels, and I really struggled. But once I came up with level one, the rest really just fell right into place. So, <clears throat> all right. So we're gonna talk about level one resilience. Level run resilience is basically this, this ball. I bounce it, it comes back. The ball, at least to the naked eye, doesn't look any different than it did before. There might be some microscopic changes because if I did it over and over and over again, it wouldn't have the same degree of resilience, but it recovers. There is a force and it recovers. And basically that is the essence of resilience, our ability to recover from some sort of external stress or force. Now, if I be shameless for a second, if anybody wants the ball, it has the Emmaus Health logo on there. So, oh, here we go. She wants it back there. There we go. So level one resilience, I have bolded here, to withstand external shocks or perturbations. So that's, we're gonna call that level one. Sorry. Level two. So level two resilience, you can see what I have bolded, absorb or withstand perturbations and other stressors and then down lower self-organization, learning and adaptation. So this is not simply responding to a stress, this is adapting to a stress. Think about going to the gym. How many of you who go to the gym go there hoping that your muscles are gonna stay exactly as they are? Let me rephrase that. How many of you who go to the gym who are not my age <laughs> go to the gym hoping that your muscles do something other than stay exactly as they are? But this is beyond simply absorbing, this is actually reorganizing and getting better as a result of the stress. 
Now let's go to level three. If you think about tempering steel, the process of tempering steel is about heating the steel, and certainly the expected outcome, the hoped for outcome, is at the end that that steel is stronger. But the reason I put this as a different stage is because in the process of heating that steel, you're also making it more machinable. You're making it more malleable. And while it is under stress is the exact time that you are better able to work with it. Certainly there could be a spiritual metaphor there as well. Now I'm going to move to level four, and this is a term that is not my own, this term of anti-fragility. And I'm going to refer to this book a few times that I really highly recommend, The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. Just curious, how many people have read this book? Quite a few people. <clears throat> so if you have not read the book and you do, I will tell you it will make you a little bit angry because you're going to read stories that you're going to say, I really can't believe that. And I will jokingly say when I read it, I thought, boy, this is plagiarized because I've been thinking these things for a long time. <clears throat> but I highly recommend the book. And what they are doing in the book is they're really recording a lot of their observations of the changing of the nature of college students. And many of them are college students at elite universities. But they're noticing how they are handling stress, how they are handling ideas that are not their own. And, and they come up with this term anti-fragility. Anti-fragility would be a good thing, but they are seeing in these students a level of fragility and a level of, of inability to handle ideas that are not their own. And so, they, as they talk about this, they talk about a, what I think is, is maybe the richest concept of resilience, which is a system that requires stress in order to be successful. And the model they use in the book is the immune system. One of the things we've seen in medicine, and they bring this out in the book, is a higher rate of peanut allergies. Well, one of the reasons there's a higher rate of peanut allergies is we weren't exposing young children to peanut antigen. And once we, if we do that, there's a lower rate of peanut allergies. Uh, when I was in medical school, we talked about the hygiene hypothesis, this idea that if People are exposed to these very sterile environments. They actually have more diseases when they get older. And being able to be exposed to these stressors makes that system stronger, which is, I think, the model that we would like to have as individuals. Not that we simply can, can withstand stress, not that we can just adapt, but we're actually require and better as a result of it. And I'm going to let you read this. I'm not going to read it, but certainly I think this concept was known to St. Paul from this uh, passage in Corinthians as well. I'll just read the last part. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Oops. All right. This is data from, this is the most recent data from the CDC on youth risk behavior. We're at a Catholic high school. We're talking about resilience and the need to instill resilience in our students. Um, this is an idea, this is a, a data that, that captures where our students are now. And many of you have seen this or seen something like this before, but this is the most recent data that came out. Obviously, it was through 2021. And these are stunning data. I mean, as a parent, this just tears at your heart. Uh, as a teacher, as a, as a priest or a pastor, I think the same thing when we see the status of our students right now. So why is this? You know, why are students struggling so much? Well, I think we can think of any number of reasons why that might be. If you think about the stressors in the world, you have January 6th, you have COVID, you have the impact of COVID on schools with people being out of school and wearing masks, Black Lives Matter, school shootings, inflation, war, gender issues. However, look at this quote. The incredible rapid rise of mental health illness since 2012 basically 
just changed or almost unaffected with COVID. None of those things that I mentioned really seem to be the answer, seem to be the explanation for the status of the mental health of our youth. If I go back to the very first Familiaris Consortio, I think this may have been a slide that we had back then. Jean Twenge, who was a uh, professor at the University of San Diego, is, is the one who's most quoted and the one who first captured some of this. And what she said is this, that she's been studying behavior change in populations for a long time. And what typically happens are you'll see these subtle movements up or down. And what she noticed is a dramatic change in 2012. What happened in 2012? That's when 50% of our children had smartphones. That's the inflection point, not COVID, not the school shootings, not any of those other things that I mentioned in those slides. You can look at this right here. Look at 18 to 25 and look at that inflection point. Uh, Dr. Twangy and Jonathan Haidt, have an interesting document online that you can access yourself. This is an ongoing live Google Doc that they've put together trying to answer the questions about the impact of social media on behavior and most specifically teen behavior. So you can look and you can see the studies that they have there. This is a summary of one of the questions that they have. So this is, again, something that's very available to anyone who wants to look at it. And one of the questions is there an association between social media use and bad mental health outcomes? And as you look at that, what you'll see is that at, at low levels, social media may actually improve mental health. That's not typically the case. For anybody who sees or talks to adolescents, that's not typically the behavior. I joke that in medicine, when somebody says they consume alcohol, we will say uh, to ourselves, well, we should probably double or triple that because we know people are not always honest. If I ask adolescents how much time they spend on social media, I can't double or triple it because that would exceed the number of hours in a day. And I think students are pretty accurate and, and honest when they're telling me this. So that, that less than one hour a day from point one is not really the way most of uh, the adolescents and, and young adults are using social media. So they really fall into those other categories where the, uh, where the mental health outcomes are worse. Okay, so <clears throat> we've, we've talked about the stressors and the anxiety. Uh, the next question is, what are the manifestations? And so for that, I go back to Lukianov and Hate, And they describe a phenomenon whereby instead of demanding resilience, uh, they're promoting what they refer to as safetyism. Joe talked about this a little bit, even with his own children, this concept of wanting to keep them all as safe as possible. But Lukianov and Hate define <clears throat> a changing paradigm of trauma. It's no longer... Um, just physical, and it's also very subjective. So if it is my sense that this concept is going to harm me, I shouldn't have to be exposed to it. And actually, my friend and colleague, Dr. Kristen Collier, is going to talk about her own experience with this at the University of Michigan. Even more recently, some of you may have read about the case at Stanford Law, uh, where it was very similar, uh, where students had a subjective sense of being traumatized simply by the ideas that someone else was going to propose, or even uh, ideas they might have held, even if they weren't going to be a part of that talk. All right, so the Lukianov and Haight never formally represent any linkage. I think there's an unmistakable reference to a book from 40 years prior called The Closing of the American Mind. Curious, how many people may have read that book? A decent number. Um, so in my mind, the, the phenomenon is the forerunner of, of the new book, meaning that it was the closing of the American mind that led to the fragility of the American mind or the coddling of the American mind. And my concern is for our future. So how will those who are fragile or lack resilience become entrepreneurs or leaders or scholars 
or athletes or physicians or teachers or soldiers or policemen or parents or on and on and on. So what is the next book in this litany? Is it the collapsing of the American mind? And economy? And the American soul? So in my final reference to the book, I love this saying, prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child, which is, I think, our task. Today, we're going to hear about the psychological response, both how we process it and what the psychological responses can be by, again, a friend and colleague, Dr. Tom Bishop from the University of Michigan Department of Family Medicine. We're also going to hear about spiritual response. I suspect all of our speakers will refer back to that. And Jen Tom is going to talk about um, her own experience, as Joe mentioned. And some of you may be familiar with her story, but she'll talk about the spiritual resilience uh, that that she had to go go through um, with her experience. Also, family responsibility. Certainly, I think all of us in our families are required... Uh, we have the responsibility of helping our children to develop resilience. Uh, And I'm certainly not going to tell you that we were perfect in the way we did it. Um, I I will say my oldest son was telling us uh, one day about a memory he had as a child. And any of you who have parented adult children know know, to question the integrity of some of these memories. But... Yeah, and so what he was telling me is that when they were children, they went straight from watching animated saint videos to Hotel Rwanda. Now, if there's any veracity at all to that claim, maybe there would have been a transition stage in there somewhere. I don't know. Uh, but, but the point is, I think exposing them to some challenging topics um, is important. And also, I think, beginning to understand ourselves and to teach our children something about uh, estimating risk and understanding risk. As you can see from this picture, here's somebody who doesn't. (laughs) So he's riding a bike uh, perpendicular to the axis of the road, not at a crosswalk and without a helmet, but he does have a mask on even though he's outside and there is no one uh, within (laughs) sight of him. And and, uh, Lukianoff and Haight talk about this as well, about how much we overestimate some risks and underestimate others. And perhaps one of the risks we even underestimate is the risk of social media. And then finally, I think we have a community responsibility um, in the it takes a village idea to be able to help each other uh, through resilience. We also need to think about the community impact and response. The Christian community is under assault as well. So how do we, not just as individuals, but how do we collectively um, uh, demonstrate resilience? All right, finally, it does all come back to Larry Bird. So Larry Bird was was known as a trash talker in basketball. That's now redundant. I think everybody in basketball is a trash talker. And this was sort of a, a famous kind of thing he would say. I'm gonna, this would be in the middle of a game. I'm going to get the ball. I'm going to take two dribbles to the left. I'm going to step behind the three-point line and stick it. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. And then he would go do just that. So where did he learn this? Well, I started thinking about this and I thought, okay, what is he doing? He's telegraphing what he's going to do. He learned that from the prophets. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? What did God tell us? He's going to send his son, right? So then Larry Bird says, there's not a damn thing you can do about it. What does God say to Satan? There's not a damn thing you can do about it. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Right? So what we have in God, we have a God who has given us the gift of prayer to communicate with him. He's given us the gift of scripture as revelation. He's given us the gift of the Eucharist to be with him. And this God says to Satan, oh, death, where is thy sting? There's not a damn thing you can do about it. So why do we have resilience? Because we've got God who's talking trash to Satan. So, makes perfect sense now, doesn't it? 